This is our second to last video on virus, bacteria, protists, fungi, and plants. The material is fairly straightforward, you just have to remember it. So we'll start with viruses. Viruses are non-living, you have to know that. Is it a prokaryote? Because it's not living, it's not a prokaryote, and it's not a eukaryote. What is it made out of? It's made out of protein and genetic material. Remember the little virus that we draw? If you just look up a virus picture real quick, it has a protein coat on the outside and a genetic material on the inside. The genetic material can either be DNA or RNA, but they're all very small. How is a virus and a cell similar? They're both similar because they have protein and they have a genetic material. Can a virus live on its own? No. The reason why virus is non-living is because it cannot live on its own. It has to depend on something else. The next one is, what is the protein code of a virus called? So we said a virus has two parts, a protein and uh, the genetic code. Sometimes a virus can have lipid as well, but protein and genetic code is something that every single virus has. The protein code of a virus is called a capsid, which is the word to remember. Uh, what is it made out of is made out of protein, protein coat. What is the virus's genome made out of, DNA or RNA? The genome of a virus, uh, are all the genomes the same size? No, some of them are larger, some of them are only 10, 15 co uh, nucleotides or 100 nucleotides, so no. What gets injected into a host cell during viral reproduction? Um, we, you don't have to know the uh, lytic and lysogenic cycle for the final, but you do need to know during a viral reproduction, uh, a virus has to attach to a bacterial cell or some other type of eukaryotic cell, for example. And in order for the virus to reproduce, it has to inject the genetic material from the inside of the capsid into a cell. So if you can imagine this circle right here, that's a healthy cell, a normal cell, and then we have a virus attached to it. The genetic coat gets injected inside the cell. Um, the next one is, uh, how does a virus reproduce? They have to reproduce using other cells. They have to inject uh, the genetic material into another cell, and then using that genetic code, the cell uh, can make new proteins for the virus as well. So then the protein code and duplications of the genes can come together and make new uh, viruses. And then something called lysis happens. All right, so. So lysis um, is how the virus actually comes out of the cell uh, after the proteins and the DNAs are assembled together. And last one is if, oh, here it is. If a virus can infect a, bac infect a bacteria, we call the virus a bacteriophage. So when you see this word, you know bacterial has something to do with bacteria. Phage means eating. So bacteriophage is not a bacteria eating something else. It's a, bacterial e a bacteria eating virus. The next one is what are protists? Um, protists is just, uh, it's, I mean, it's really important, but we don't talk about it very much, because mostly because we don't understand it that much either. But protists um, are, can, can be all kinds of things, but they are not plants, they're not animals, and they're not fungi. So th that's the other group of eukaryotes and um, their protists. What are some examples of protists? Um, examples, oh, we don't have any here. Um, so the examples could be kelp is an example. Those are the, the large um, leafy things in the, in the ocean. Those are kelp, you can look up a picture. And then um, they're amoeba, amoeba. Um, those are also protists. Um, protists, because some of them are unicellular, some of them are multicellular, some of them can move, some of them cannot move, um, we also want to talk about how they can move. So a modal plant, uh, a protus, wait, no, this is so wrong. Uh, a modal protus, right, when they're modal, they, 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 can, they can move. How can they move? Uh, they can use cilia, so those are little tiny hair around a protus cell. Flagella, that's one long tail. Um, on the outside of the protist, and then pseudopods. Pseudopods are fake feet, so those are um, amoeba has pseudopods that can help them move. How do non-modal protists move? I'm probably saying the word wrong, but whatever. Um, sorry. So non-modal pro protists, they move with the assistance of wind and water current. So for example, kelp, those large leafy things in the water, 
uh, they can move with the water current. Next one is fungi. Fungi structures, um, so first off, what are they? Some examples are yeast or mushrooms. They're heterotrophic. They can be unicellular or multicellular, but they're mostly multicellular. Um, there's something called a fruiting body. You need to know this word. Fruiting body is the reproductive organ of fungi. So mushroom itself is a fruiting body. Um, the fruiting body also produces the actual reproductive cell. In this case, for uh, mushrooms, or actually for all the fungi, we call those spores. So those are the reproductive cells produced by fungi. And then uh, they are they have some very important ecological roles. One of the most important ones is decomposers. So fungi help decomposing the things that die. For example, in the fall, the leaves fall off and they somehow get their nutrients back into the soil and fungi help doing that. Oh, now we're, we can move on to plants. So you don't have to know too much about protists and fungi and uh, virus and bacteria, but it's just the basic stuff, so you know, what are they, what can they do kind of things. Next one is introduction to plants. Plants can make sugar, we all know that, but what is a sugar? A sugar is a type of uh, macromolecule called carbohydrates. What part of a plant produces carbohydrates? That would be the leaves because carbohydrates are produced by chloroplasts. And as you know, chloroplasts are green and what part of the plant is actually green? Usually, those are the leaves. So those, um, the leaves are the sites for photosynthesis, for the food production for the plants. Um, you might think, well, so why is plant producing food? It's producing food for us. No, it's not producing food for us. It's producing food for itself because plant cells, just like all the cells, need energy in order to survive and reproduce, making more cells. So plants can reproduce, uh, plants can reproduce their own, sorry, again. so plants can produce their own, oh my gosh. So plants can produce their own sugar and then those sugar can use, uh, can be used to fuel the activities in the cells. The next one, what part of a plant cell uh, produces carbohydrates? Oh, plant cells, so that's chloroplast in the plant leaves, plant cells. What do plants need to survive? They need a few things, water, nutrients, minerals, and sunlight. Um, water and sunlight, oh, as well as carbon dioxide, this is important. These are all uh, needed for photosynthesis. Nutrients and minerals are needed for the plant cells. Roots absorb water. Uh, roots also help holding the soil together. And the entire plant receives water after the, the water is absorbed by the roots. What are some biggest challenges land plants face when they first started to grow on land? So at the beginning of plant life, they were in water, but then um, they started to grow on land. The biggest challenge of having anything on land whatsoever is the lack of water, the, the, the difficulty of conserving water because the sun is, uh, is always shining and is evaporating a lot of water. So the biggest challenge is obtaining and conserving water. And how did plants, um, how were plants able to adapt to that? They can, they eventually developed vessels. So um, those vessels include xylem and phloem. So xylem is used to transport what? Water. And then phloem is used to transport food. So then these structures can allow water to be transported from the roots of the plant to the rest of the plant. Um, right? And then they can also become heat resistant because it has all those water filled parts within the plant. And then plant leaves also have certain structures, and we'll talk about that. Um, that will that al eventually allowed plants to live on land. What are some major groups of plants? Um, you need a. You don't have to remember this cladogram because if I ask you any questions about one specific thing um, that's related to the cladogram, then I'll give you the cladogram. However, you do need to know that there are non-vascular land plants. For example, mosses. So those are the really tiny, you know, the, the mosses. Um, they can grow on rocks. So mosses are non-vasculars, that's why they're so small. Here, right here. So mosses is non-vascular. That's why they're so small because they, um, 
when mosses、uh, get water, it can the water can only diffuse through the parts of the moss. It cannot actually be transported at at anywhere very easily. And then the next one is called ferns、um, or va vascular plants. And the example is ferns, so they cannot reproduce with seeds. But they still have to be able to reproduce, right? Otherwise, they will go extinct. So the way that re they reproduce is that they produce spores. They do not have flowers, for sure. The next one that showed up was gymnosperms. So gymnosperms are vascular plants. Angiosperms are also vascular plants. Gymnosperms are the ones that produce cones. They do have seeds, but they don't have flowers. They do have seeds, no flowers. And then the last one is angiosperms. They do have flowers, and they do have seeds. And when they can produce seeds and flowers, they can also produce fruits. Does a non-vascular plant have roots or xylem?、Uh, no, that's the whole point of xylem. It's for transport of water. If it's non-vascular, it doesn't have the vascular tissue, so it doesn't have xylem. What is the function of a xylem? Transport water. What is the difference between xylem and phloem? Phloem transports food. Uh, and food is produced by photosynthesis in the leaf, and then it's transported all throughout the plant, and then usually it's stored in the roots. However, water comes in from the roots, going to the leaves, and then, well, going through the stems, and then going to the leaves for photosynthesis as well.、Um, plant part two: How can seedless plants reprodu reproduce?、Um, does the reproduction of mosses and ferns need water? They, where to go? Oh. In seedless plants, they use haploid spores. We just talked about it, right? If you're a,、um, a fern,、uh, you can't produce、uh, you can't produce seeds, so then you have to produce spores.、Um, those are just like reproductive cells. Mosses and ferns both require the use of water. Two organs that seed plants can rely on for reproduction: cones and flowers. Asexual reproduction cloning of plant called oh, this is called vegetative propagation. Vegetative propagation. That's what a plant can just a part of the plant can go into the cell soil and then it will grow a whole entire plant. But it's a clone of the first plant. There's no sexual reproduction, sperms and eggs involved. Pollen grain is a male gametophyte. So gametophyte、um, is basically sperm for.、Um, For plants, so pollen is the male part, the male gamete.、Uh, what mechanism allows the completion of pollination of the gametophyte? So you need to know what pollination is. Pollination is when you put the gametophyte, the male gametophyte, and the female gametophyte together. So the pollen would be the male gametophyte, and then、uh, the egg within the ovary of a flower will be the female gametophyte. So when an animal can carry Male gametophyte, the plot pollen, onto the、um, this part, the stigma of the flower, and then the eggs are in here. There's the pollen right here, and then you can have new plants. What is the function of seed coat? So here we have a seed. On the outside of the seed, we have the seed coat. So you just think about a coat of any kind. It helps protect you. It helps、um, for for a plant for a plant seed. It helps. Preserving water,、um, because within this part, the cotyledon, or you can call it the, the endosperm, there's a little bit of water and a little bit of food, and those food and water are needed by the embryo, because when the embryo wants to sprout,、um, that requires the cells to、uh, divide, right? And if there's any activity for the cells whatsoever, they need energy. Where do they get that energy? They get it from the seed itself. That's why. It's so nice to have sexual reproduction for plants to have the seeds because that gives them a lot more opportunities to reproduce,、uh, even if the environment is not that great. And what condition allows the growth of embryo? So when does a seed sprout?、Uh, if you just think about it, if you want to plant something, you have to put it in the sun and you have to water it. So sunlight and water, and then that at that time, the cells within the seed will know. Okay. The, the situation is good. Now we can move forward. Where are the seeds and fruits produced in an angiosperm flower? So here we have a flower. The seeds and fruits are produced in here, the oval, ovule, and attract. What, what, 
What is the, oh, okay. What is the advantage of having flowers? Why do flowers exist at all? Because that can help um, attracting pollinators so that you have a bee come to over here and then go to another flower, right? And now uh, the pollination happens. Now it allows genetic variation for the flowers because we have different plants crossing is uh, sperms and eggs. So you can have all different kinds of plants being produced. So that's nice. Um, this is nice because plants can't walk, right? For, for uh, an animal, they can walk around and choose their mates and mate with, you know, other types of the, the animals. But plants can't move. Um, you can kind of think of pollinators as the legs of a plant because it virtually allows the plants to move and mate with something that's really far away from them. What is the function and advantage of having fruits? Um, the one, one thing is the fruit helps uh, protecting, protecting and dispersing the seed inside it. So if you think about an apple, an apple, you know, when we eat an apple, we don't eat the seed itself, we're eating the fruit, but the fruit helps protect, protecting the seed in the center of the apple. But it also helps dispersing the seed because when an apple falls from the tree, um, it, it's also dispersing the seeds inside it, right? Um, the last one is having fruits is also nice because you're attracting animals, so fruits kind of become, fruits and the animals kind of becomes the legs of the plant. And then the animal can eat the fruit and then, um, you know, take a dump somewhere else so that the seeds can be carried from, uh, from one area to another, which allows the, the plant to spread, right? And spreading is always nice. Um, here are some different parts of a plant. You can just take a look at this. If you just think about it, right? A petal attracts pollinators and animals. Right? They're, they're all pretty. Nothing is pretty usually for no reason. Even people are pretty usually for a reason. Um, <clears throat> they, they try to dress up to attract mate a lot of times. But in this case, the petals attract pollinators and animals. Then we have sepals that can protect the flowers before the flower is uh, is blooming. Uh, we have the carpal, pistil carpal. So this part, a stigma style. Uh, this whole thing is called a pistil. But this part is the female gametophyte in the center. It has a ovary, stigma, and style. And then um, this next one is ovary. Uh, it's also in the center. And that's where the egg stays. And then we have style, whatever. This is not very important. And we have stamen, right? Oh, the anther and the filament together is called a stamen. And then we have the anther uh, where, where the, uh, the male gametophyte, the sperms are on here, the pollen. And then we have the filament that support the anther. Okay, next one is what is a meristem tissue? The uh, meristem tissue... They're undifferentiated, unspecialized plant cells. So, so meristem is similar to stem, right? People have stem cells and plants have meristem cells, meristem tissues. And what they can do is that they can differentiate into many different types of plant cells. Remember when we did the crossword puzzle, there was the word differentiation because cells can differentiate and turn into other um, types of cells that have a certain function. So plants can do the same thing. Where is the apical meristem located? They're located on the bottom, on the tip of the root and the buds. Okay, so the tip of the, tip of the roots need to keep on dividing and uh, extend the, the root um, downward into the soil. And then the buds where you have, you know, the buddings. Um, you have you also have cells that are actively dividing into new cells. Primary and secondary growth. Primary is growing vertically up and down. So roots growing down, that's primary growth. Uh, trees growing taller, that's primary growth. Secondary growth is uh, sideways. If a tree is growing wider, if the leaves are extending sideways, those are secondary growth. So you can take a look at this picture. All right, going this way is primary growth. Going this way is secondary growth. What are some functions of the roots? Um, it can hold the plant, it can hold the soil, it can store the food, absorb water, dissolve nutrients. Um, it's great. 
How does fungi and bacteria help roots? Mutualistic relationships. So some fungi and bacteria live on the roots to help um, absorb some of the nutrients, and then also they oh well they they're getting nutrients from the plant, but they're also converting nitrogen sources, um, the nitrogen in the air into other types of nitrogen that the plant can use. Why does the plant need nitrogen? Amino acids are made out of nitrogen. There's nitrogen in the DNA, so you can't have any of that without nitrogen. What is the epidermis of the root? That's the outside skin of the root. Whenever you see epidermis, that's the skin of something. Can roots store food? Yes. Uh, if I give you a root, okay, you need to know the vascular cylinder for sure. The vascular cylinder contain xylem and phloem. Remember, xylem and phloem transport water and food. We said that a billion times, but those are called vascular cylinder. And then we have endosderm. Um, I don't think you need to know this actually. Not anymore. Woohoo. The next one, what are some functions of the stem? What are functions of the leaf? Stem holds the plant. Wait, we already said that. Oops. The leaf um, does photosynthesis, which we went over that already. There are a few more things that you need to know about the leaf itself. There are uh, certain areas on the leaf that serve very, very important functions. So start first with the epidermis. That is the outside skin, outside skin again of a leaf, helps protect the leaf, uh, it helps um, absorbing sunlight, um, all that. Waxy cuticle, waxy cuticle is the waxy layer usually on the top side of the leaf, it helps protecting the leaf. Um, let's say there's an insect coming onto the leaf, sometimes it's, it's very slippery and well, potentially sometimes hairy for the, for the insect, then they wouldn't get on there anymore. And then it also helps reflecting some of the sunlight because the sunlight has a lot of energy and that's not always great because if you have too much energy then then I mean one one possibility is that it's dehydrating the leaf too much and that's not very good. And then we have two types of mesophyll cells, palisade mesophyll and spongy mesophyll. These vertical cells are called the palisade mesophyll. mesophyll. They're as you can see they're dark green in this picture. The reason why it's dark green uh, in this picture is they're trying to tell you that there are a lot of chloroplasts in there, so they do a lot of photosynthesis, okay? And photosynthesis is always important. And then we have something called spongy mesophyll. So those are the ones on the bottom. They're much larger and there's a lot of space in between, just like a sponge. And the reason why it has all those spongy spaces is so that carbon dioxide can come in and go through all those sponges and go to the palisade mesophyll. And the reason why it wants to do that is because photosynthesis needs carbon dioxide and carbon dioxide can come in. And then oxygen that's produced during photosynthesis can also go out. But also the plant all over the plant has water and the water can also evaporate through these, um, these spaces, these air spaces called created by spongy mesophyll. Next one is a vein. If you create, well, I mean, if you see a leaf at all, they will have these, um, you know, lines on them. Those are the veins. It help transport water and sugar. And then, oh, do we not? Let's say uh, you have to know there's something called uh, stomata. Stomata are these holes. These holes allow the air to actually come in and come out, um, which is important because without carbon dioxide, Plants can do photosynthesis, and without photosynthesis, there's no oxygen, and without oxygen, we can't breathe. The next one, how does the opening and the closing of the stomata help plant maintain homeostasis? So as we said, one, one of the biggest challenge for a land plant is to, uh, get, is to get and preserve the water, right? So the closing and the opening of the stomata um, help maintain the homeostasis of water within a plant. So we have all these holes that allow the carbon dioxide to come in and oxygen to come, come out. There are hundreds of those holes on one leaf. And so they're not always open. During the day, they are open. Well, more of them are open because uh, you want all the carbon dioxide to come in to do photosynthesis. But at night, they kind of close up because we don't want to, we can't do photosynthesis anyway at night. So then there's no point in opening those up and losing water. But also when it's really hot outside, some of these holes will close up so that we're not losing as much water to the intense sunlight. What is transpiration? 
Um, you definitely need to know this. Transpiration right here is the evaporation of water from the leaves. So if you think about it, evaporation happens everywhere. And because there are all those holes on the leaves, water can come out pretty easily. And uh, what was I going to say? Oh, so transportation, oh my gosh, transpiration is the evaporation of water from the leaves. So if you think about it, when there is a lot of humidity in the air, it's harder to evaporate things, right? If, you, if it's very humid out, outside and you pour water on the ground, it's not going to evaporate as fast. The same thing with transpiration. It's not going to happen as fast. So the rate of transpiration is decreased by high humidity. And then it's increased by wind and light intensity. Just like if, you, if there's a lot of wind or if, it's, if there's a lot of light, sunlight, then the water is going to evaporate a lot faster. Last two, whoa, phototropism and, tropism and gravitropism. Phototropism is a plant's growth towards sunlight. Plants need to do that uh, so that it can do photosynthesis. That's the central idea of, of all life on Earth. We depend on plants doing its photosynthesis right, and they do it right on most days, and that's great. Gravitropism is plants uh, can sense gravity, and the roots will grow toward gravity, and then the plant leaves will grow away from gravity. And that's also important because the roots growing toward gravity can allow them to find more water and nutrients and allow eventually photosynthesis to happen. And then with the leaves growing upward, um, photosynthesis is always happening. Photosynthesis, yay.